We are very pleased to have with us Michael Christopher Lowe. Um, he's an assistant professor of history at Iowa State University, currently the senior humanities research fellow at NYU in Abu Dhabi. Um, his research interests include the late Ottoman Empire, the Arabian Peninsula, the Indian Ocean world, about which he's written uh, um, you know, extensively, and then environmental history. He received his PhD from Columbia University. Um, and he's the author of the book that he's going to talk to us today about, Imperial Mecca, um, Ottoman Arabia and the Indian Ocean Hajj. Um, drawing on Ottoman and British archival sources, as well as published material in Arabic, modern Turkish. Um, Imperial Mecca analyzes how the Hejaz and the steamship era pilgrimage to Mecca simultaneously became objects of Ottoman modernization, global public health, international law, and inter-imperial rivalries during the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, Professor Law's um, articles have appeared in a number of journals, Comparative Study in Society and History, uh, Environment and History, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, and he serves on the editorial boards of the Jur Journal of Global History, Journal of Tourism History. Um, he, of course, works in a number of languages and archives, and his current um, and future kind of work um, relates to histories, uh, environmental histories of desalination, water management, infrastructure, energy, climate change in the Arabian Peninsula, the wider Middle East, and um, this part of the Indian Ocean. So we're very, very pleased to have you with us, Chris, and it's a real honor for us. And I know you're very busy doing a lot of different book events. Um, and this is really a book that's making waves, so to speak, and uh, kind of, uh, and we're going to actually have our little reading group discussion um, related to your work later on Thursday. Um, so you'll have a number of colleagues and people in Doha joining us. Um, but of course, this is available to a wider audience as well. So over to you. You have about right. 30, 40 minutes and we'll take Q&A at the end. All right. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Let me just shift here and share my screen. All right. So uh, first, again, a, a really huge thank you to Uday Chandra uh, for organizing this. I'm, I'm definitely very excited to be in contact with the Georgetown uh, Indian Ocean Working Group um, and really just so happy to be presenting uh, to an Indian Ocean audience. Um, I should say from the beginning that uh, the literatures on the British Empire, the Indian Ocean and South Asia really inspired uh, many of the questions uh, in this book. Um, but I hope in a way that this book uh, answers back to that literature uh, in a slightly different voice, in an Ottoman Turkish, Turkish uh, and Arabic uh, archival voice, if you will, uh, adding something new to the uh, really lively conversation on the colonial Hajj. So let me begin. Uh, I want to show a, a, a quote here that I think captures uh, Istanbul's fear of Britain's colonial reach from both India and Egypt uh, into Arabia. So in this and many similar intelligence reports, Salim Munir Pasha, the Ottoman ambassador to Paris, repeatedly warned his superiors in Istanbul that the British Empire was engaged in a sweeping strategy to transfer the Ottoman Caliphate to the Sharif of Mecca and bring that most sacred Islamic office under the sway of Britain's Indian Empire. By doing so, he believed that the British plan to bring the Hijaz, Najd, and Iraq under British protection and eventually turn them into colonies, not unlike Aden or any other British possession. Now, despite this really dramatic tone, what is perhaps most notable about the ambassador's quite breathless claims of diabolical plots is their utter ordinariness. While the timing, detail, and plausibility of these files differ slightly from case to case, from roughly the 1880s onward, this genre of intelligence reportage emerges as a ubiquitous feature of the Ottoman archival collections from the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid II and the empire's final years leading up to World War I. Reports of British efforts to transfer the caliphate from Istanbul to Egypt or Mecca and wider British strategies to colonize Ottoman possessions in the Gulf or the Red Sea come in many forms, 
Now, of course, if we look at a map of the Ottoman Empire on the eve of World War I, the feeling of British encirclement is palpable. Of course, the Khedivate in Egypt was gobbled up and occupied from the 1880s, Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Of course, Aden was a protectorate uh, by World War I, Kuwait. And of course, there were the attritional uh, relationships all throughout Oman and the rest of the Gulf. And of course, uh, sort of bullying behavior on the part of the British uh, sort of overshadowing Qajar Iran uh, as well. So we can really sort of feel this sense of Ottoman vulnerability. Now, there are lengthy briefs from Ottoman diplomatic personnel stationed in Europe, Egypt, and even the empire's fledgling network of consulates across the Indian Ocean. There was an almost endless supply of translations and press clippings from European, Egyptian, and Indian newspapers dedicated to this subject. There are also colorful reports from spies and informants, so-called journal gilair, uh, recounting the, uh, uh, the efforts to shadow anti-Ottoman propagandists. Now, in one such journology report from 1910, an Ottoman informant warns of, warns of the rapidly multiplying Indian population in Mecca. As the author warns, the Indian population numbered in the tens of thousands and had doubled several times over in recent years. A cursory glance at these numbers gives some credence to our informant's concerns. In the 1860s, British consular reports estimated that there were some 10,000 Indians living in the Arabian Peninsula. By 1880, the British consulate estimated that in Mecca alone, the Indian colony reached as many as 15,000. By the close of the century, British subjects in the Hijaz, the bulk of which were Indian Muslims, accounted for at least one seventh of the province's total population. In Jeddah alone, there were 300 Indian families. And as a result, over half of all Hijazi trade flowed through Indian hands. In short, Indians constituted the single largest diasporic community in the Hijaz and the largest contingent of Hajj pilgrims each year. In many ways, one of the arguments of Imperial Mecca is that Mecca was as much an Indian or Indian Ocean space as it was an Arab, Ottoman, or Middle Eastern one. As the anonymous informant uh, hypothesizes, the British had undertaken a project to encourage Indians to take up residence in the Hijaz with the intention of using them to lay the groundwork for their ultimate goal of transferring a caliphate to the Sharif of Mecca. As proof of this scheme, the author cites a recently published article in the pro-British Egyptian newspaper, Al-Muqatam. Now, Al-Muqatam, uh, this, this article had apparently been translated and circulated in the European press. The piece supporting British designs on moving the caliphate to Mecca was anonymously signed an Indian in Mecca, or Mecca-i Mukaramide Bir Hintli. Now here, our Ottoman informant paints a scene worthy of a Hollywood spy thriller. He claims to have set out to uncover the identity of this Indian author. In the course of his inquiries, he discovers that the author had recently arrived in Cairo. The informant goes on to tell the whereabouts of what he believes to be an Indian spy in the service of the English crown. Our Ottoman informant's sources uh, uh, reported multiple sightings of this suspected Indian spy, tracing his movements from the offices of al muqatam through the labyrinthine alleys, shops, and coffee houses of the Khan al-Khalili Bazaar. In the end, however, the Ottoman informant claims that his suspect escaped back to Mecca, melting into the steamer traffic headed to Jeddah. Now, what is most striking about this evocative fragment from Cairo, regardless of the actual veracity of this kind of uh, often false intelligence chatter, is that while it warns of precisely the same kind of vague plot to transfer the caliphate as those uncovered, quote unquote, by the Ottoman ambassador in Paris and countless others, the Journalogy's version hints at something more specific, a deeper cluster of anxieties about the Ottoman state's inability to fully control the Hijaz's heterogeneous mobile populations, whether they be Bedouin or transient foreign pilgrims, and strengthen its territorial sovereignty over this traditionally autonomous province. Due to its sacred status, the Hijaz was never, of course, an ideal or even realistic candidate for occupation, annexation, or formal colonial rule. Likewise, both British imaginings and Ottoman fears of a colonial plot to transfer or otherwise manipulate the caliphate at least until the cataclysmic events of World War I and the Arab Revolt, remained entirely in the realm of fantasy. However, as this report suggests, in the final decades of the 19th century, Britain's creeping involvement with the day-to-day -day affairs of the Hajj 
and its diasporic colonial subjects had forced Ottoman officials to acknowledge the Hejaz's vulnerable position as a contested frontier and inter-imperial borderland nestled in the extraterritorial shadows of the Raj's Indian Ocean Empire. Now, the vexing questions that these anxi anxieties raised for Imperial Mecca's core subjects, excuse me, form Imperial Mecca's core subjects. Now, this book asks how European imperialism, the advent of steamship transport, and the increasingly interconnected nature of the Muslim world changed the traditional complexion of Ottoman pilgrimage administration. And in turn, how did the rise of colonial rule in the Muslim world alter the Ottoman Empire's relationship with non-Ottoman Muslims? Did the diaspora of Indian Muslims sojourning or settling in the Hijaz represent a cat's paw of British extraterritorial legal and political influence? Did the Ottoman state really consider ordinary pilgrims and diasporic subjects of Britain, France, the Netherlands, and Russia living in Jidda, Mecca, or Medina as potential fifth columns? To be clear, and I would emphasize this strongly, there is no evidence to suggest that Ottoman officials believe that Indian or other foreign Muslims themselves ever actually constituted a seditious threat to the Ottoman state. However, by virtue of their acquisition of colonial nationalities and extraterritorial legal claims, they entailed foreign pilgrims provided a powerful pretext through which European states could interfere in the affairs of the Muslim holy places. As a result, Yildiz Palace was forced to impose previously unthinkable, even exclusionary policies to shield territorial sovereignty of the Hijaz from the potential threats posed by ordinary pilgrims and migrants whose colonial passports and nationalities had come to unfairly mark them as potential pawns of hostile European powers. In turn, this conceptual transformation of ordinary pilgrims into potentially dangerous foreign subjects opens a paradox. How should we square these anxieties with the Hamidian regime's promotion and even weaponization of supranational pan-Islamic solidarity and spiritual authority as tools of geopolitical strategy? On the other hand, how could a non-Muslim colonial empire realistically hope to pose a credible challenge to the Ottoman Sultan Caliph's claims on Islamic legitimacy and sovereign, excuse me, sovereign authority over Islam's most sacred sites? How did the introduction of this new colonial element alter the shape of Ottoman governance in the Hijaz and even threaten to unravel the region's traditional system of layered sovereignty and power sharing between the central government and the Sharifate of Mecca? And finally, how did the late Ottoman state seek to defend itself and mitigate the symbiotic internal and external risks posed by this combustible mix of weak autonomous rule and aggressive colonial extraterritoriality? So taking this heightened Ottoman sense of vulnerability as its point of departure, Imperial Mecca seeks to understand how European colonialism arrived in the Ottoman Hijaz as really a steamship stowaway. It tells the story of how the Hijaz and the Hajj were simultaneously reshaped by the competing dynamics forged between the ever expanding reach of Britain's informal empire in the Indian Ocean and Arabia and the nascent projects of frontier modernization that the Ottoman Empire deployed to shield this most sacred and most exceptional territory. It excavates the curiously understudied case of a faraway frontier province at the very heart of Islam and imperial legitimacy. It attempts to locate an enigmatic place caught between two imperial worlds, an Ottoman island adrift on a colonial ocean, lost in the gaping chasm between the area studies regions that we now artificially divide into something we call the Middle East and South Asia. Now, to begin this journey, we must start with the intertwined colonial crises of cholera and Muslim mobility that focused Britain's and the rest of Europe's attention on the Indian Hajj for nearly a century. So here I've put up a, a map that really shows the sort of principal uh, nodes of the Indian Ocean steamship Hajj uh, that are featured in this book from Singapore and Bombay to Aden, Cameron Island, Jidda, Egypt, uh, and all the way to Istanbul. Now, it's here that we find the deepest roots that fed and sustained this most brazen and unlikely of colonial challenges to Muslim rule and sovereignty in the age of imperialism. From the mid-19th century onward, the Ottoman Empire was no longer free to act as the sole custodian of the Hajj. 
The affairs of foreign Muslim subjects making the pilgrimage to Mecca gradually came under the scrutiny and surveillance of European colonial regimes. For the first time in history, the pilgrimage to Mecca, Islam's most sacred rite, became an object of international regulation and non-Muslim intervention. Although European interest in the Hajj was a global phenomenon affecting multiple empires, the most decisive, most threatening driver of this dramatic shift in the administration of the Hajj was the expansion of Brit the British Empire in India and the rest of the Indian Ocean. Now, while the impetus for the British Empire and Europe's sustained diplomatic and security interest in the Hijaz and the Red Sea stemmed most directly from the international sanitary and trade concerns generated by repeated uh, pilgrimage-related cholera outbreaks from the 1860s onward, such interests cannot be easily separated from more uh, classically direct political considerations. In the decades following India's Great Revolt of 1857-58, variously known as the Great Rebellion, or of course by its uh, now antiquated co colonial moniker, the Sepoy Mutiny, British officials also became obsessed with the Hijaz and the Hajj as potential threats to the Raj's security. In the wake of the Indian uprising, British officials became convinced that a diasporic network of Indian distants, exiles, and outlaws domiciled in the Hijaz were complicit in the violence against Christians in Jidda that broke out in 1858. They also came to believe that these Indian exiles might also be exercising a radicalizing influence on returning pilgrims or forging anti-colonial ties with the Ottoman state itself. Thus, by the 1870s and 18, early 1880s, the conception of the Hijaz, or excuse me, this conception of the Hijaz, was incorporated into a new uh, set of concerns that the region was becoming an outlet for Sultan Abdul Hamid II's pan-Islamic outreach and propaganda to Muslims living under colonial rule. Now, despite the very tenuous basis uh, that these theories had in reality, these deeply Islamophobic British fantasies of the Hijaz as a haven of criminals and fanatics or a den of pan-Islamic and anti-colonial radicalization contributed to durable scripts that would partially define the empire's expansionist interests in the region from the 1850s through World War I and even beyond. Now, owing to these competing interests, the steamship era Hajj produced the first global crisis of mass Muslim mobility. Muslims were racialized, pathologized, and singled out as both the carriers of dangerous microbes and subversive, even uniquely violent ideas. In many respects, the plight of steamship going pilgrims invites loose comparisons with the present. Today, the Islamophobia, Islamophobia of the post 9-11 era has branded Muslims worldwide, even the most vulnerable refugee populations as potential terrorists giving rise to additional border security, more stringent passport and visa controls, racial profiling, and even outright travel bans. While today's Islamophobia revolves around air traffic, immigration policies, and the assumed threat of groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS terrorists, such fears are neither new nor are they novel. Western attempts to restrict Muslim travel, mobility, and migration share an intellectual lineage forged in the age of steam, which I think is uh, sort of of continuing relevance uh, to today's questions. Although their fears were of course not always guided uh, by any uh, uh, sort of grounded reality, European colonial empires had the power to rewrite the terms of pilgrimage and Muslim travel. This power affected the lives of millions of ordinary Muslims and migrants. And as this book shows, it would also dramatically reshape the task of governing the Hijaz and the Hajj for the world's only remaining Muslim power, the Ottoman Empire. In this sense, the first global controversies over Muslim mobility also helped us to better understand the impossible dilemma of a Muslim imperial sovereign in the age of European colonialism. In order to refocus our attention on how the Ottoman Empire dealt with this crisis, this book advocates a change in perspective one that builds on and engages with the colonial archive and historiography of the Hajj, but recenters the story on the Ottoman Empire and the Hijaz. Now, I should say that uh, it, this is certainly not the first book uh, to deal with the history of the colonial Hajj. There's some really excellent work. John Slight's work on the British Empire, Eileen Kane's uh, on the Russian Empire, Sarab Mishra, uh, to just name a few. And of course, articles from a variety of really fantastic historians. Niall Green uh, is one that immediately pops to mind. 
But one of the things that is missing is the sort of the center of the story, the Ottoman Hijaz itself, the Muslim holy places themselves, and a Muslim sovereign. Um, and together, um, in my book and uh, Lale John's excellent uh, new book from Stanford University Press, I think fill that gap uh, uh, that has been missing uh, in recent years. So here I want to argue that between roughly 1850 and World War I, and arguably beyond, the Hijaz and the Hajj became ensnared in an asymmetrical clash of competing claims, pitting the Ottoman Caliphate's sovereignty over the Haramain and spiritual authority over non-Ottoman Muslims living under colonial rule against the technological, military, diplomatic, and legal might of the British Empire a non-Muslim state asserting its quizzical status as the world's most populous and powerful, quote, Muslim empire. Of course, Britain was never benevolent in its protection of the pilgrimage um, as it claimed to be. Its concern to sustain imperial rule and desire to uphold pre prestige throughout the Muslim world always guided its calculations. Despite the bald hypocrisy and ultimate futility of this effort, it did succeed on a certain level. It forced the Ottoman state to defend itself on previously unimaginable ideological, legal, and technological terrain and to fundamentally reconsider the Hijaz and the Hajj as potentially vulnerable, even quasi-colonial spaces instead of uncontested symbols of Islamic sovereignty and legitimacy. Now, Imperial Mecca takes this dramatic role reversal as its central problem. As a result, this book takes up a different line of inquiry from those previously pursued by historians of the colonial era Hajj. Rather than focusing solely on the sanitary and security risks, both real and imagined, that the Hajj presented to colonial empires, this book explores how the extraterritorial evolution of Britain's Indian Ocean pilgrimage bureaucracy presented an even broader and more grave challenge to the Ottoman Empire's traditional role as the protector of the Hijaz and the Hajj. It details how the advent of steam-based colonial pilgrimage radically altered the traditional duties and responsibilities of the Ottoman Sultan Caliph in his capacity as the, sol uh, excuse me, the servant of the two holy places, or Khadim al-Haramayn al-Sharifayn. This is essentially the crux, the, uh, the great Ottoman dilemma of being surrounded by colonial empires. Now, the Sultan Caliph remained, of course, the legitimate sovereign responsible for the administration and protection of the land-based Hajj. And yet custodianship of the oceanic steamship Hajj represented an almost entirely novel field of governance. Ottoman custodianship was no longer just a matter of providing subsidies to the Bedouin, patronage to the denizens of the holy cities, and seasonal security for the camel caravans from Egypt and Syria. The advent of the steamship and mass pilgrimage had altered the scope, scale, and global importance of the Hajj by many orders of magnitude. As a result, the Sultan Caliph was forced to shoulder what I call a double burden. The Ottoman state had to continue its traditional duties and early modern practices of custodianship and to simultaneously coordinate its administration of the Hijaz and the steamship Hajj with rival colonial empires who were often quite hostile and meant to undermine Ottoman legitimacy in the Arabian Peninsula. So having laid out some of the, uh, what I would say are kind of the big picture concerns, some of the problems that motivated uh, my writing of this book, I wanna do a kind of brief uh, overview of the structure and coverage of the book. Um, hopefully this won't turn out to be too much of a, a kind of infomercial for the book, uh, but I do hope it kind of whets the appetite uh, for, for those who are interested. So in chapter one, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the territory that I've covered this far. Um, chapter one really describes the origins of this clash in the wake of India's great revolt of 1857-58, British colonial administrators increasingly, as I mentioned before, single out Muslims as a racialized minority, uniquely pre predisposed to jihad and anti-colonial rebellion across a variety of territories. In 1858, of course, by sheer coincidence, really through a totally different set of concerns that were uh, much more internal to dynamics between Istanbul and the Hijaz, um, Jidda's Christian population was massacred. But for British officials, these two events blurred into a single narrative of anti-colonial conspiracy. Now, 
As British officials became increasingly reliant on ethnographic knowledge to understand and control their Muslim subjects, they thoroughly conflated Islam and its institutions with the roots of anti-colonial subversion. At the time, however, Islam became central to the colonial state's efforts to represent and legitimate its mission to its Muslim subjects in India and elsewhere. And this is a sort of evolutionary process that sort of spans between the 1850s and really uh, the 1880s and the end of the 19th century. As a result, while European colonial engagement with the Hajj, of course, never fully outgrew its impulse to spy on and monitor the pilgrimage to Mecca, over time, surveillance did yield new understandings of the day-to-day -day mechanics of making pilgrimage. From the 1880s onward, efforts that had initially been driven exclusively by a thirst for medical and political intelligence gradually morphed into a more nuanced effort to position the colonial state as a facilitator, promoter, and even protector of Muslim rights to a safe, clean, affordable, and efficient Hajj experience. Of course, in chapter two, I trace how British consular officials in Jeddah, both Muslim and Christian, began to poke holes in the Hijaz's exceptional religious and legal statuses. By the conclusion of the 19th century, the vast majority of the Muslim world found itself, of course, living under European colonial rule. As a result of this unprecedented situation, the traditional legal fabric of the Ottoman capitulations, which really regulated uh, relationships between uh, uh, non-Muslims, right, visiting the Ottoman Empire, uh, allowing them to uh, not be subjected to Sharia law or Ottoman law. Uh, this was superimposed on the Hajj experience by European colonial officials. Although the capitulations were never meant to apply to foreign Muslims living under colonial rule, and the Hijaz had always been explicitly exempted from these arrangements, from the early 1880s onward, British consular officials and colonial officials waged an aggressive campaign to extend the privileges of consular protection to Indian and other colonial subjects traveling or residing in the Hijaz. In turn, British India's extraterritorial protection of its pilgrim subjects came to present an increasingly vexing and dire challenge to Ottoman sovereignty and the empire's legitimacy as the rightful protector of the Hijaz and the Hajj. Now here I try to explain how the Ottoman Empire quickly learned and adopted new practices of Eurocentric international law, new to, uh, kind of a new toolkit, if you will, to protect its sovereignty. And ultimately, this also uh, led to a kind of uh, spinoff. Uh, my other new book collaboration, also out this month from Indiana, Indiana University Press, uh, called The Subjects of Ottoman International Law, uh, which I worked on uh, with uh, Lale John, uh, Kent Scholl, and Robert Zenz. Uh, we're really proud of this project, and we feel like um, by sort of uh, fleshing out a kind of introductory sketch in this edited volume to uh, uh, Ottoman interests in uh, consulates, diplomacy, passports, mobility documents, international law, extraterritoriality, autonomy, we've really given a kind of toolkit that hopefully uh, will spark new research uh, within Ottoman studies and hopefully beyond. Um, incidentally, there are quite a few essays that deal with the Indian Ocean in this text as well. Now, from international law to bacteriology and quarantines to telegraph lines and railways, the Ottoman state struggled valiantly to keep up with the rapidly evolving challenges presented by the steamship Hajj and European extraterritoriality. Ottoman officials confronted empire-wide fiscal constraints and of course, frontier specific logistical uh, limitations. Moving to part two, uh, which I called ecologies of empire, we move from legal entanglements to epidemiological and uh, environmental ones. In chapter three, Instead of asking how the global crises of cholera and pilgrimage regulation affected Europe, free trade, or its colonial possessions, as it has in most of the, uh, uh, the other uh, Hajj histories, I try to recenter this story on Istanbul, the Hijaz, and the Red Sea. By doing so, we find the Ottoman state fighting a war on two fronts. Once again, the Hijaz is caught in the long shadow of British India. As pilgrimage-related cholera outbreaks attracted ever more international attention, consular and colonial officials sought to exert greater and greater extraterritorial authority over their colonial subjects during their time in the Hijaz. 
At the same time, however, even in the face of a mounting body of scientific, really a tidal wave of scientific evidence to the contrary, uh, Britain repeatedly denied that India and its pilgrim masses were in any way responsible for the spread of cholera to the Hijaz and the rest of the Ottoman Empire. Thus, rather than supporting Ottoman and international quarantine initiatives, between the 1860s and the 1890s, even up through uh, 1900, even after uh, Robert Koch's discovery of the formal mechanisms, the uh, cholera bacillus, uh, the sort of bacteriological underpinnings of how cholera worked, British India emerged as the chief obstacle to the imposition of stricter international quarantine and public health uh, uh, strictures. Now, of course, quarantines were only one piece of, of a larger picture. In chapter four, I turn to consider the question of Hajj-related water infrastructures. Here I trace how the Ottoman state sought to deliberately deploy new forms of techno-scientific discipline in order to simultaneously meet its international sanitary commitments, re-engineer the region's defective environments, and tame its uh, resistant urban and Bedouin populations. Now, in both chapters three and four, I ask how the implementation of European-inspired medical practices, infrastructures, and new technologies were understood and received by foreign pilgrims, urban Hijazis, the Bedouin, and the Sharifate of Mecca. And most critically, what were the limitations of Ottoman sanitary and environmental discipline in a religiously conservative, tribal, and traditionally autonomous frontier province? As all of these questions suggest, while the colonial archive fixates on the international maritime controversies, quarantines, issues of free trade, the Ottoman archive reorients us towards a more complicated collision of inner imperial rivalry and expertise and more localized stories of cholera's role in the dynamics of reform and resistance as Istanbul sought to adapt its own modernizing visions to the realities of its tribal frontier. Uh, in the images here, uh, we see uh, an image at the top of Jeddah's first desalination system installed just before World War I, um, which has become really the inspiration for uh, my second book project to kind of tell a story of fossil fueled first steam and then oil, uh, H2O, fossil fueled water, as kind of the lifeblood of the Arabian Peninsula and to trace its Indian Ocean and Ottoman roots and then follow that story all the way up into the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, as I move into part three, managing mobility, I examine the regulation and restructuring of pilgrimage transportation systems from steamships and passports to camels and railroads. In chapter five, I explore how the Ottoman state's inability to curtail the Shrifate of Mecca's autonomy had really disastrous consequences reaching well into, or excuse me, well beyond more traditional concerns around Bedouin disorder along the Hijaz's caravan routes. Instead of thinking of the Sharifate and the Bedouin as essentially land-based interests existing apart from the transoceanic industrialization of the steamship pilgrimage, this chapter demonstrates how both local and trans-imperial Hijazi pilgrimage service, service providers moved with the times, reimagining and reasserting their authority over the Indian Ocean Hajj. This chapter also examines how the lack of coordination between Ottoman, British, and international approaches to major questions surrounding indigent pilgrims, passports, and steamship regulations allowed for the growth of an increasingly coercive and corrupt monopoly system governing virtually every aspect of the pilgrimage experience, from steamship tickets and water supplies to pilgrimage guides and camel hires. Here I show how weak mechanisms of inter-imperial regulation and international law were consistently conditioned, evaded, and subverted through the collaboration of a constellation of Ottoman governors, European consular officials and businessmen, Indian Ocean business interests, uh, Hadrami interests, and all of these working in concert around the Sharif of Mecca. And finally, in chapter six, from the sort of fast paced uh, steamship Hajj, we decelerate from the industrial world of the steamship and uh, the supposedly, uh, we, we enter a kind of uh, pre-industrial dom domain of camel transport. Here again, we find that even the Bedouin world of the camel caravan had also been assimilated into the Indian Ocean pilgrimage services monopoly. Thus, instead of the figure of an atavistic Bedouin blindly defending a timeless or traditional Hijaz 
against the forces of modernization, we find Bedouin camel guides, the Sharifate and an Ottoman governor acting as innovators and defenders of a new synthesis of steam and camel labor. In turn, we find each of these actors presented with a stark choice between protecting their own from the 1880s onward entrenched commercial interests in the Indian Ocean's steamship and caravan economies versus serving the advance of Ottoman centralization being conveyed along Hijaz telegraph and railway projects. Thus, in a cruelly ironic twist, the overlapping crises of mobility and sovereignty surrounding the steamship Hajj proved instrumental in framing the underlying logic of the Hijaz Railway's utility and marshalling political and financial support for its construction, of course, with great help coming from the Indian subcontinent. And yet, between the early 1880s and 1908, the durability of the economic and political alliances forged <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Forged around the local administration <clears throat> of steamship and camel transport, linking Ottoman officials, the Sharifate, urban Hijazi elites, and the Bedouin worked assiduously to undermine Istanbul's rail based technical solutions. Thus, in the end, Abdul Hamid II's patient gambit deploying new infrastructures and technologies to rearrange the Arabian landscape in a bid to gradually narrow the Hijaz's traditional autonomous privileges failed. In the end, the sovereignty and administrative competence that this ultimate pan-Islamic symbol sought to project would remain an incomplete project stalled in Medina and denied by the Hijaz's stubbornly durable autonomy even before the empire's British rivals struck the final blow to, to Ottoman rule in the region during World War I and the Arab Revolt. And finally, in the epilogue, I examine the legacies and afterlives of the modern Hajj forged between the Ottoman Empire and British Empire. In these concluding sections, I examine how World War I and the ouster of the Ottoman Empire from Arabia revived Britain's long latent fantasies of transferring the Caliphate to the Sharif of Mecca. Ultimately, this ill-fated project was met with almost universal anger in India and across the Islamic world. And yet, even in the uh, failure, uh, Britain's long campaign to place the Hijaz and the Hajj under British protection, it really unleashed shockwaves that would reverberate from Istanbul to India and beyond. In the years following World War I, the Ottoman Empire turned Turkish Republic would abolish the Caliphate, even as Indian Muslims rallied to its defense. And even though the Hashemite kingdom and puppet caliphate that Britain tried to foster was rapidly overthrown by Saudi, uh, excuse me, uh, Saudi uh, Najdi Wahhabi warriors, the international administration of the ocean going Hajj remained in British and European colonial hands until 1956, 1957. By tracing the slow decolonization of the oceanic Hajj, we find a modern pilgrimage system shaped by the legacies and scars of decades of inter-imperial rivalry and the pathologization of pious mobility. Perhaps more than ever, these lessons are relevant to the world of COVID-19 that we find ourselves living in today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been a fantastic um, and really, really informative session. Um, we have a um, uh, time for question and answer, maybe about 20 minutes or so. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, you know, in fact, what we could do is there's, there we have a few people here, all of whom are experts in their own right. Um, what we can do is maybe promote them to participant and perhaps they can just ask their own question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Amira, you know, I'm just going to not just allow you to talk, but I'm going to promote you to panelist. And then, uh, and this is the true for um, anyone else who wants to raise their hand. And I'll just uh, do this. And then you can ask your own question. And, you know, we can kind of proceed from there. Amira, and then Ragaya. Yeah, I tried, to, I tried to get on, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. This was very interesting. I look forward to reading your uh, your book. In fact, uh, I'm thinking of actually using your lecture for my for my class in the 
in the spring and I may call on you to, to, to Oops. Close then, unfortunately. Yeah, you might want to take your um, video off in case there are some issues. To join us, if uh, since I'm, um, uh, the question you don't deem to add, I would appreciate it. Uh, some of the material we got with Kuwait, uh, which was uh, dating from the 1930s, and in that document, it is the document that you'd have to fill to get. Uh, uh, permission to get um, uh, almost like a visa or the uh, to be able to get to, uh, to, to to travel here. The thing is that uh, you know today, if you are a woman, uh, you would have to say whom you're going with as a uh, whom you're accompanying. But in that document, it does not actually ask for who are you accompanying. So a woman could just put her name in. Maybe it was assumed she would be alone. I don't know. But the point is. Uh, I've had that document and I'm very curious to learn more about the policies regarding women and, and Hajj uh, previous to the coming of the more strict uh, sort of Wahhabi uh, approach to, uh, to uh, women's travels uh, uh, following uh, oil and the 50s and the 60s and so on and so forth. So uh, again, I, I, it, you may not have met with this, but maybe you have with these documents that, that you had to fill in what changes yeah place regarding, you know, getting a visa. Amira, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the very beginning of your question was cut off. I, I got that it was a document from the 1930s. Where was the document from? It was from Kuwait. For some reason, I'm, uh, yeah. in, in my my mute and my start video keeps on going off and on. So I, and no I'm worries. not, I think you're controlling it with I, I don't know, because it's not happening here. It, this is from Kuwait. It's from Kuwait okay. and uh, it's dated in 1930s. I believe it was 32, but I'm, I'm not sure. My memory is not that sharp. So, uh, so yeah, so, if, if, I, I don't know if you have any, any uh, even direction as where to look, I'd be very happy. Yeah, so some, I think some interesting things that we can say about passports in general that we can learn from uh, uh, pilgrimage passports. I really, I, in the book, uh, sort of gesture to a couple of experiments with these kinds of documents that I think are really central to the foundation of our modern passport regime, right? So two main groups in the 19th century that emerge as problem spots for empires are Asian labor, right? So quote unquote, coolie traffic, uh, either from uh, South Asia or from China. Um, and of course, pilgrims, right? And so these are two groups for which passports became an increasing uh, interest for colonial empires. Now, one of the things that I think is important is that until after World War I, we don't get a really universal sense of passports being used. Um, one of the things that I document in my fifth chapter is the sort of starts and stops between uh, the British and the Ottomans trying to use uh, both visas and passports. The Ottomans wanted to use passports, but then gave up for a variety of reasons because uh, in many respects, this only gave the British more ability to sort of use their extraterritorial influence, right? And so of course the Ottomans preferred the Murutis Kirisi, uh, a sort of internal passport, uh, a sort of pass document. Um, but to sort of more directly answer your question about this 1930s document, one of the things that you see in the pilgrimage passports is that you have for the, uh, the Indian documents, uh, family passports. And so the head of household essentially would get the passport, but it would be a document that covered his dependents as yeah. well. Right. So after World War I, we start to see individualized passports, sometimes family documents. Um, I had the privilege to look at a variety of passports from the Khalili Family Trust uh, to do an article on sort of mobility and public health issues and got to see passports from the 19th century all the way up through the 20th century. We start to see more um, precise uh, documentation from World War I, but especially by the 50s. You start to get pictures, right? Of course, there was a, a certain uh, trampling of Muslim sensibilities about photographs, right, on their uh, documents that had to be overcome in some respects. Um, and then you also start to see individualized uh, a, a personal documents, even for women. But I think to sort of answer your question is that until the 1950s, I certainly wouldn't expect universally to see a document just for a woman. Um, and this makes it very difficult actually to trace and track how many women are moving 
Um, you get traces. I have several instances where I get complaints about the treatment of women in quarantine facilities, for example. And I also see consular uh, records with uh, disputes over power of attorney and real estate questions that crop up um, sort of addressing women's position in, in Hajj. Um, but the sort of certainty of having one person, one document definitely comes much later than the period for which I discuss, unfortunately. But I'd really be happy to chat with you about it uh, in greater yeah, depth. Yeah, well, I would love it if you could write us a paper because, I mean, what you're really saying is that uh, the decision making had, you know, uh, came along with need and therefore there was really no precedence in stopping women from traveling alone. Uh, when we were doing Gulf Women again, we saw pictures of actually, I have one picture that I referred to uh, where uh, two women uh, referred to as sheikhs were actually uh, on a camel and with just a guide who were, and they were traveling uh, uh, from one part of uh, Arabia to the shore. And basically they did not have any mehrim with them. This is why we became very curious about the movement yeah. of women. And so, but thank you very much for, uh, for responding. I'm good to... Uh, get your book and, and take a look at that chapter and see where we are. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, Rugaya, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Michael. Thank you so much for your most fascinating topic. I think I don't learn any lessons uh, because I asked somebody, a historian, McDowell, a couple of weeks ago, ago about something regarding the future. And he said, as historians, we are not <laughs> to talk about the future. But, but you zeroed in uh, on so many topics, although the Ottoman, although very historical, but you, you talk about the vulnerabilities. Uh, have you ever uh, considered or can you you know, just make me understand some more the rivalry in Hajj, for example, when we look at the incidents of the attack on Mecca, the issue of the Iranian claim to Hajj, and also most recently, the question of the Dwil al-Hajj or the globalization, the internationalization of Hajj that Saudi Arabia should not be the sole guardian and profiteering from this religious tourism. What are your thoughts? So in the, in the epilogue, this is sort of my sort of concluding bit. And one of the sort of cautionary tales uh, that I put forward is that in some respects, the sort of rivalries that Saudi Arabia has engaged in uh, in mm. the Cold War, right? Um, both internal and external, right? Using the Hajj to burnish its legitimacy as a Sunni power uh, and also as an aggressive tool against uh, the Shi'i uh, both within Saudi Arabia and, of course, uh, in Iran. It reminds me quite a bit of this sort of uh, Anglo-Ottoman uh, uh, conflict. I, I think we certainly see echoes there uh, of the way in which, uh, you know, this 19th century uh, conflict played out. Um, you know, I, I think that Saudi Arabia has been very careful to sort of use this tool Right? They tiptoed right up to the line of calling themselves a kind of de facto caliph in the 1980s. Right? When they oh. took up the title of Khadim al-Haramayn al Sharifain, they were mm. signaling to the rest of the Sunni world, we're the sort of most important, most essential state because of our uh, you know, custodianship uh, yes. of the Hijaz and the Hajj. Um, and I think that that period after 1979, certainly, both with the Utaybi uh, uh, attack, uh, the siege on the, uh, the mosque in Mecca, and mm -hmm. the Islamic revolution, we saw this period, right, of a sort of uh, an Islamist phase uh, in mm -hmm. Saudi politics. Now, what we're seeing today is a sort of a slight return, I think a return to form for Saudi Arabia, a kind of aggressive modernization phase that is slightly less concerned with that Islamist uh, competition with Iran, right? And so I think we have this constant tension in Saudi Arabia, right? And mm -hmm. I think that we're gonna see some flashpoints perhaps in the coming years, the opening of tourism. Um, I, I had my tourist visa, in fact, ready to go before the, uh, 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 the pandemic struck. Uh, and mm -hmm. 
I think that there are going to be tensions, right, between this new role that looks slightly more like uh, an Abu Dhabi or Dubai, right, opening yeah. up to tourism versus this traditional role. Um, and I think it's going to sort of open Saudi Arabia up to certain criticisms, right, in terms of their role as custodian of the Hajj. Um, but again, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is speculation, um, but this sort of game of using custodianship over the Hajj as a sort of political tool, it's always a sort of dangerous thing to play with. Okay, thank you, Mike, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And we have one more question from our colleague, Suhaira Siddiqui. And um, I've just promoted her um, to participant. Um, yes, yeah, Suhaira, whenever you're ready. Hello? Yeah. Okay, sorry, for some reason I was booted out. Um, thank you, Michael, for this wonderful and really enlightening presentation. That was a really joy, it was a joy to listen to. Um, I had a question about some of the fears of kind of anti-colonial resistance. So um, I've been reading kind of the, 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 the difference in the fatwas between kind of pre-1807 and then post-1857 in, in India and kind of the shifts of a lot of these scholars in terms of how they're talking, not just about jihad, but also talking about the empire and how much they can kind of be involved in whether it be ju being judges in courts or whether it being registrars, all of these conversations are really percolating in a post-1857 context. And so one of the arguments um, that you do kind of see come up is some scholars are advocating to do hijra. And so I'm wondering to what extent are some of the kind of sentiments um, or the concerns of the British that are rising in this post-1857 context now that they, but, but they're saying don't, don't fight in India and, um, and, and you're able to be part of the government now, but if you don't want to do that, then go elsewhere. So how much is the British fear um, maybe as a result of the success of um, quashing the rebellion, now it's a fear of maybe the Muslims are gonna take this rebellion elsewhere because there's still obviously um, scholars that are saying it is an obligation to wage jihad against the British, but maybe just not in this context anymore. So just your thoughts on that would be really interesting. So I, I think that there's a, a little bit of an ebb and flow to this question, right? It's not universal from 1857 you know, through the end of my project. And the way that I try and sort of trace this curve is to say in 1857 and 1857 58, the British were, they were overwhelmed, right? They were sort of uh, seeing, you know, ghosts around every corner. Um, and so what happens in Jiddah, although it has very, very little to do at all with India, right? It really has to do with uh, sort of Hadrami re reactions to the arrival of. Uh, sort of British consul authority, sort of intercommunal conflicts between, uh, you know, Ottoman characters, local Arab characters, Hadramis, um, and uh, the sort of uh, doing away with a salt monopoly, slave trade, a bunch of different factors, right? But for the British, they see this as a sort of pan-Muslim, you know, anti-colonial set of conspiracies. One of the things that they hang their hat on with this is Said Fadl, of course, from Malabar, uh, who had been exiled to Hijaz um, previous to 1857-58. And so they sort of used Said Fadl as a, a character around which they were able to kind of concoct all of these fears, joining together the Ottoman situation with the British. But I would also say that within India itself, um, your questions about sort of fatwas and sort of jihadist rhetoric, right? If you stayed in India, if you weren't uh, transported somewhere else to the Andaman Islands or put into exile, you know, you do, if you don't go to Afghanistan or the Ottoman Empire, you had to tamp down your rhetoric, right? And of course, there was this sort of Wahhabi trials, um, of course, which Julia Stevens has written about so eloquently. Um, we see a kind of rise in paranoia about these things through the 1870s and a kind of peak in the late 1870s and early 1880s, kind of joining together those questions with nascent fears about Abdul Hamid and Pan-Islam. Once we get past the early 1880s, those fears about the Hijaz start to really subside and you get a much more realistic picture of what's happening in the Hijaz and you start to hear much less of that, right? It's still a script that certain colonial figures repeat over and over again, right? It's Orientalism, you know, it, it gets picked up and recycled in various ways, but you do sort of have a competing set of narratives 
after 1882, where you have British figures, especially Muslim consular figures on the ground who are actually sort of giving a more accurate picture of what's happening, right? So I do, I think you have a kind of spike in paranoia that levels off after a certain amount of time. Um, of course, I'm not really the authority to sort of look into the fatwa uh, situation in South Asia. Uh, Elizabeth Lost, I would say, would be the person I would turn to, Julia Stevens. Those are the experts who would probably give better answers, but it's, an, it's a really great question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't know if you want to follow up, uh, Sahara or... Um, Um, but if anyone has a question, this is a, you know, we have a few more minutes. I, I guess I want to follow up on what um, Sahara asked by, um, you know, that there is a kind of discourse uh, which you see in the Wahhabi trials and in after 1858, that there's a discourse which perhaps comes out of the experience of the rebellion. It kind of probably was created in the, in the spur of the moment, so to speak, but, um, and it relates to the word fanaticism that appears again and again. And there's almost the sense of a reverse flow that, you know, this is associated with the Arabian Peninsula and it comes back with these people um, who go on Hajj or go on, um, you know, as merchants or in any other capacity um, or perhaps both. And I wonder um, whether um, these, uh, this language you see in the Red Sea, you see it elsewhere, and what you make of it in the context of your wider book project. So I don't address this particular set of questions other than to sort of think about, uh, you know, ex quote, ex mutineers, uh, fanatics in their mm -hmm. context in the Hijaz, right? And the way in which fears about them, in particular, Said Fadl, uh, you know, Kernawi is another uh, figure that, could be used as an example of this. Um, you know, they play a sort of bit part, but my sort of broader reaction to this is always a suspicion when we talk about the Arabian Peninsula sort of being the source of this, and then South Asia is the recipient uh, of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always reminded of uh, uh, Aisha Jalal's uh, Partisans of Allah, and I really disliked that book on a lot of levels, in part because of this consistent sort of claiming that fanaticism comes from somewhere else, uh, that uh, any sort of jihadist impulses are imported from somewhere else. And so I, this is in part one of the things that I try to show is that this discourse about fanaticism comes out of colonial South Asian discourse and actually misrecognizes other things that are happening in the Ottoman Empire. There may be fanaticism there, but they ascribe very different causes to it and misread what's happening in the Hijaz in the 1850s. And really it sort of sticks with them in some respects all the way through the 1880s. Um, and so part of what I try to show is the way in which the South Asian lenses make it very difficult for the British empire to understand the Hajj for decades as a result of this kind of rhetoric. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, and this is probably something that goes before 1857, because as you as you know that um, Jalal's, you know, one of her early chapters relates to Balakot and the martyrs, and you know, and it really, um, you know, it's been it's been a while coming, which is why you know the fanaticism as a as a kind of catch-all explanation for the rebellion is is kind of at hand, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you see in my book is instead of reaching for pan-Islam for explanations that have to do with Abdul Hamid II's personality, his paranoia, uh, or terms like fanaticism, I try to sort of force readers to think about day-to-day -day mechanics, material questions, health, passports, steamships, uh, mm -hmm. how much a camel costs, uh, you know, the cost of a railway ticket, these very basic and quite fundamental questions and how they shaped both of these empires engagement with the Hajj. I sometimes think that we use these sort of big catch-all categories about Islam and they occlude and obscure actually what's happening on the ground. And that, that really, I think, if, if I have one big takeaway, is that sort of reading the details, you know, deep into the archive, you find some different stories there. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, I'm, I'm really curious to see how you're making the connection between this current 
um, project they are working on in terms of the management of water in Arabia and you know the arrangements made during the Hajj and you know um, there's, there's a really fascinating kind of a, I'm sure cross pollination that's happening. Well, you know the the the, the initial idea it was maybe maybe the biggest uh, uh, accident of my career. Um, you know, I went into the Ottoman Archive armed with a lot of questions, especially from South Asian literature. And so I went in looking for quarantine and cholera. And instead, I started to find many, many more documents on water infrastructure and stumbled across from the 1890s through World War I. You know, I had to kind of, you know, do a double take. You know, when you're a non-native speaker, you're reading Ottoman Turkish, you're like, am I, am I seeing this properly? And so the, lo and behold, I get these documents about turning uh, salt water into sweet water. And I start to do more digging and more digging. And it ended up as an article in CSSH in 2015. And it really launched the idea for me. Um, the more that I've been at Iowa State, I've been teaching on environmental history uh, and climate questions. And I wanted to really connect my previous work on disease and environment and technology and bring it from the 19th century all the way forward to the present. And so I felt like desalination did a couple of things. It allowed me to think of a long durée history of water in the Arabian Peninsula, but it also allowed me a different way to think about energy in the Arabian Peninsula, one that predated oil, right? So instead of thinking of desalination as a quintessential product of post 1970s rentier states uh, and those kinds of things, the history of desalination was ringing the Arabian Peninsula with the British Empire from the 1850s onward. And really to sort of think about a fossil fueled system of provisioning drinking water all the way back to that time period as a way to really sort of shake up a lot of categories. And the other thing that I really love about the project is I have material from the Ottoman archive, from American archives, from the BP archives in Britain, material on the Hijaz, on Sudan, on Egypt, the Mediterranean, Aden, Kuwait, UAE. So it really does sort of span all the way around the peninsula instead of becoming a Gulf only kind of project. Right, right. And it really does connect with what you, uh, you know, your, your paper, your kind of special issue of, you know, actually kind of connecting the study of the Middle East to the Indian yeah. Ocean. I think it's a very important contribution. Yeah, Rugaya, sorry. Udai, I just wanted uh, to bring to uh, your attention, Michael, uh, the new uh, book on Gulf Sustainable Urbanism. Uh, and uh, in that, it was supposed to be an encyclopedia. It is available online, but um, it was um, supposed to go in three phases, past, present, and future. And uh, I think the discussion on the, on the past is particularly relevant to what you are talking, especially the entries on water, disease, ecology, environment, you know, since we are talking 16th and 17th century onwards. So um, if you don't find it, please communicate with me and I'll make sure to... Uh, and you just to sort of make sure that I am taking notes properly. Gulf sustainable development, urbanism, Gulf urbanism, sustainable urbanism. urbanism. and uh, it is edited by Nadir Ardalan and Spiro S P I R O Polalis P O L L A I S. Thank you very much. Good, and I also think that. Um, Stephen Caton wrote in the context of uh, Kuwait and water security issues. So maybe that would- I, I know Steve from way back in Yemen, 2006, oh, yeah. many, many moons ago. That Great. is fantastic. You, you will see if you go to the, also the, the virtual events, Steve and I uh, talked, you know, as part of this book launching last week, but I am particularly interested in your viewing and reading of the part that concerns the um, environment uh, and water by Jack Spengler. Okay, thank you. This is really you helpful. You are welcome. You are welcome. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you very much, Chris. This has been really informative and we are going to keep talking about your work. We have a reading group coming up on Thursday and we really look forward to you know, discussing it as a group. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. Our pleasure, absolutely. And all the best with all your different book talks and your stay in Abu Dhabi. Thank you so much.